is whatever we see um, or expect consistent with current evidence. So that means primarily knowledge of what has happened in the past, but also sensory experience right now. So just to demonstrate how this works, if you could all shut your eyes just for one moment. So really actually for about 30 seconds for a little demonstration. Now, eyes shut, everybody. I want you to point in two directions. One is I'd like you to point at the door you came in, and secondly, point at me. Now, open your eyes. Well, and of course, now, most of you are pointing correctly at the door, right? And only a few of you would have been pointing at where I actually was because having just changed, sensory input told you your mental model wasn't correct any longer and you updated and you changed it. It's a very simple idea. If sensory information is available, it predominates. It is overwhelming. But if it's not present, eyes were shut, where's the door? Nobody objected to that. You say, oh, well, I'll use my memory, right? And so we use what information is already in ourselves if we don't have current information available. And that shows what's going on in dreaming. So in dreaming, we're asleep in bed, for example. Our eyes are shut. Sensory input is decreased. And yet our brain is turned on, so we have a model of the world. We have a representation of what's going on. So here we've got something like, this is perception. We're going to call it dreaming, which is to say world simulation. It's a virtual reality or a dream where we are, in this case, constrained by sensory input. For dreaming, it's the opposite. We have perception, the same process that we just saw of point to the door, point to Stephen in the absence of sensory input. And that then we could say is dreaming is perception unconstrained by sensory input. So perception and dreaming are the same process under two different conditions, whether the sensory input is predominant or not. But it's the same thing. So this is a dream. So our, our, our cat, of course, may not fully be there. Dreaming is perception unconstrained by sensory input, and vice versa, perception is dreaming constrained by sensory input. So let's, let's think about now one special case that is of great interest to us, and that is the case of being in a dream, knowing it's a dream while it's happening. And this is an idea that ooh, 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, uh, when I first started getting interested in the topic, science was quite agreed on the fact that it just couldn't happen. It was an impossibility. So a philosopher, for example, Norman Malcolm said that the supposed judgment that one is dreaming is unintelligible. It's just an inherently absurd way of talking. It just doesn't make sense. So you couldn't be doing that because you're being awake while you're asleep. Uh, there's something wrong with that. So the problem is really, uh, it's a little hard to see this guy, but here's our sleeping gypsy. Um, somebody could. <laughs> Thank you. Let the air be less light. Okay. Uh, well, in any case, there's a sleeping gypsy there, and he's got a dream going on in his mind. How does the lion know what that is? How, how can you cross those two different worlds? That's the question. Now, I had had the experience of lucid dreaming myself several times and had the idea how this could be proven that I actually was conscious during the dream state. I knew about research that had shown that when you wake a person up after dreaming or REM sleep, they would often show a, a striking pattern of eye movement activity that could then correspond to the dream report. Here is a case where there is two dozen regular left, right, left, right eye movements going back and forth. And 
during these two dozen, after the two dozen eye movements, they woke the person up and said, what were you dreaming? And he said, standing on the side of a ping pong table, watching a long volley. So that showed that under the, the special circumstances of a dream, a ping pong, you could know what a person was doing by looking at their eye movements. So we decided we could use eye movements as a signal to indicate, I know I'm dreaming in the laboratory. Here is a, the last five minutes of a 30 minute REM period where a person is doing exactly that. They woke up five minutes after five minutes of dreaming and reported having made five signals. Here's the first one, it's a left to right looking at my ear, left ear, right ear, left ear, right ear and back. You see these eye movements are, are easily distinguishable from the more random looking ones for the rest of, of REM sleep. So that's when the subject said, I knew I was dreaming, I made the signal. So then I'm flying around the dream world for oh, another minute and a half. And then I wake up and make the appropriate signal, which is for a pair of eye movements. So here's, I know I'm dreaming and here I believe I'm awake. But in fact, it looks the same record after and before. So person is only dreaming he's awake. In his dream, he's writing out his dream report, you know, which of course won't be there when he actually wakes up. But somehow, uh, a few minutes later, uh, the technician, the dream dream technician came into the room, starts tearing off his electrodes. So he thinks, wait a minute, this is still a dream and then makes a signal over at three, just uh, on the other side of that shadow, flower. And he says that I didn't do it quite right. So there's actually three pair here, he said. So he waits a few seconds and repeats the signal correctly. And here's the two pair exactly as required. Then he wakes up over at, at five, makes the appropriate signal. And so here we see these five signals all exactly corresponding to the report, we see them on the polygraph page in those days, which is to say objective scientific evidence that should have proved to any skeptic that it was possible while one is in a dream to be fully conscious, at least to the extent of being able to make voluntary actions and signals. Here's another example of a lucid dream starting at the very beginning of the dream. REM sleep just begins here. There's a suppression of muscle tone paralysis and eye movement start. And 20 seconds after the REM period begins, the phone rings in the subject's dream. He answers it and realizes, oh, this is a dream. He got the message. So he makes a signal here. And it's, it's very obvious that the difference between the signals and the non-signal eye movement. So it's clearly possible to communicate directly from the dream state. Another example where instead of using eye movement signals, we used Morse code in the form of twitches from the left and right arm. So I'm the subject here. And when I realize I'm dreaming, I clench my right well, my left fist, left, 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 right, left, left. And we get this pattern, which is Morse code for SL. Subject, lucid, lunatic, my initials. <laughs> Take it as you will. It's a complex pattern of behavior that is not going to happen randomly. So the, 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 the evidence, I think, is quite clear from the scientific Western perspective that lucid dreaming does happen. It must happen in REM sleep. Uh, we don't have time this morning to talk much more about that other than the bare fact that there's a methodology possible to explore this. So I want to share one or two examples of the mind-body relationships we've been able to study using this method. We can ask people to go into the dream world with a certain mission. So here's, we'd like to know how dream time works in the sense of, can we measure how long a dream lasts? So here in the top panel, we see 
three pair of eye movement signals while the subject, while awake, estimates 10 seconds. So she makes a signal here, counts 1,001, 1,002, up to 10, makes a second signal, and then estimates 10 seconds without counting, makes a third one, and that's while awake. So later that night, she's in lucid dreaming, she remembers her mission, which is to carry out this exact same task. And here we go, eye movement signals. She's counting 10 seconds out in her dream, second signal and so on. And you can see the obvious precise correspondence, how long it takes in the dream as it did when actually awake. A similar kind of result we find with respiration, one can carry out specific patterns of respiration, breathing in different ways in the dream state that appear quite clearly in the sleeping body. So here again, two pair of signals and between the first and second, the person breathes as rapidly as they can. And so there you find this very rapid breathing, 160 breaths per minute, up from the 20. And then he holds his breath for five seconds and you can see that quite clearly there. Just to say, the mind-body relationship shows that when you dream you do something to your brain, it's as if you're actually doing it. Now that fits with the experience, because the, the phenomenology is it feels like you're actually doing it, of course, because dreams feel as real as waking life does while it lasts. So, meanwhile, back in the East, this, what I just described to you, is, is really the last generation or so of research in the West just has overcome skepticism about the bare possibility of lucid dreaming. In the East, for at least a thousand years, there's been a yoga of the dream state where they have made practical use of lucid dreaming. And uh, very briefly, just to go over the broad areas of how it works is the first step is to comprehend the nature of the dream state. That is to say, to recognize your dreaming. We have made a, a lot of progress on that particular front in Western research recently because we've had technology and new techniques that have made lucid dreaming much more accessible. In the Tibetan tradition, it was a matter of an advanced technique practiced after many years of, of meditation and already having considerable skills. But it's much easier for us today, thanks to new technology. The next part of the Tibetan practice would be to take whatever content occurred in a lucid dream and to transform it, to change whatever happens. So let there be more light, you know, and there would be more light. In fact, do let there be more light, please. That would be, you know, we don't really need less darkness. Thank you, more for example, so, or flowers, you know, instead of one, make them multiple, and so here's a field of flowers, or uh, many people make them one, uh, basically transforming everything you find in the dream state, and discovering that it all is transformable. Every bit of the dream can be changed. And we don't have time to go into the details, but we have verified much of that changeability of the dream state in scientific research. Then, once we have gone through enough experience of saying, yes, it's all a dream, it all changes, I can transform any of it, it's all in my mind, we get to the realization that the dream state and the content of the dream has all got to be the same kind of thing. It's all an illusion. It's as if we're watching all of our experience on television, and it's always on television. It's of its nature, it must be. What is portrayed on television may be something of truth or a further illusion. It may be, for example, a newsreel showing an event that happened in the physical world, or it may have been entirely constructed on a, on a stage somewhere. But it also may be a great play, for example, portraying truth in some way. So the fact that life is an illusion doesn't preclude the understanding and of having a sense of value from it. And finally, in the yoga 
of the dream state. Uh, after one has practiced all of the dream content work of transforming and experiencing how the dream stuff is all dream stuff, then the, the final stage is, is to meditate on the thatness of the dream state of recognizing finally that the, the stuff of dreams, the visual stuff, for example, I see an image of people in a room that I seem to be in, is the same kind of image, is the same kind of stuff as the stuff of waking or dream consciousness. There's all a continuity. Now, we'll notice that I haven't really said anything about that non-duality, right? I said a little bit about science and how and the fact that there are scientific approaches to a topic of, of considerable interest for us here. But I, I'd say the non-duality is like the fifth leg of our elephant in the dark, that somehow it's, it's what's always here, but we can't see directly, yet it shows itself. It's what is the given somehow. It gives meaning to it all, and lucid dreaming, in fact, is a way that one can directly approach an experience of the nature being what has always been the case. In the lucid dream, one can carry out, instead of the tasks that you saw earlier of uh, carrying out uh, breathing or singing, counting, dream sex, or whatever the experiment was, one can ask for an experience of the greatest significance or meaning or see, let me experience in some form what non-duality is, what the meaning is. So finally, I want to say that we're here in a, a case where we're saying perceiving is dreaming true in the sense that what we're dreaming right now is related to a part of reality called physical reality. Whereas dreaming, that thing that happens at, asleep at night and so on, is perceiving free, meaning independent of constraints. So we have the, the two different cases, one here where we can interact in a shared dream and while asleep in bed where we can explore what life would be like if there were no one but ourselves. So on that note, I will thank you and open for questions. We we'll probably have time for a question or two. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, th that's a big question. How could I have more lucid dreams? And the best thing I'd say is uh, read my book. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, or look at the website. But the basic methods have to do with increasing memory for dreams so that you get to know your dreams better, you recognize what's dreamlike about them, and then you set your mind to remember in the future to notice when these dreamlike things happen. And it's definitely something that uh, results after some months of practice in the ability to have lucid dreams voluntarily. So, uh, well, one uh, or two more? Yeah. One and then? Hmm? Inception, yeah. Uh, well, briefly about it. Inception, I think, is best regarded as a, a, a dream about dreaming. It's, it's in no way accurate. It doesn't, almost everything it shows is the opposite of the way things work. It's like dreams work by opposites, you could say. So um, it's, it's an intriguing, fun uh, film that stimulates a lot of interest, but it's by no means a guide to reality. You need to just ask yourself, how did they get those drugs in the dream, in the dream, in the dream, in the dream? I mean, <laughs> it just doesn't hold together. It's like a dream, so. Yeah, the, uh, yes, yeah. and, and uh, I think it's just as consistent to say instead of we have a dream within a dream, it's another dream, it's a recurrent, it's a cycle, we're in a loop, we're going around and around in circles, uh, rather than going deeper and deeper and deeper, because there really was no evidence of distinguishing different la layers or just the same thing again. Big question. I'd be happy, by the way, to address these during the conference at another time, because we're very constrained for time right now, and here we have the the time man coming up here to say. <laughs> so, thank you for appearing in my dream and letting me appear in yours. <laughs>